Let's transition now to talking about equilibrium in context. The first context I want to focus on is that of dissolution and precipitation. These two processes are microscopic reverses of one another. And they're relatively simple processes involving the solvation of a solute by a solvent and the opposite process, the desolvation or re reformation of a solid precipitate from dissolved ions or particles in solution. Although the reactions themselves are relatively simple, I think this is actually a virtue at this point because it allows us to see how equilibrium applies to a real situation without getting bogged down too much in complicated chemistry. Let's start with an introduction to dissolution reactions. When a solute dissolves in a solvent, the solvent molecules surround the solute molecules and bind to them via intermolecular forces. We call the solute in that case solvated, and you see a couple of pictures of solvated solutes at the bottom of this slide. I really like this image of dissolved CO2 in water. Notice that the negative end of water's dipole is closer to the positive end of CO's bond dipoles. The central carbon is the partially positive atom in CO2. Furthermore, the positive end of water's dipole on the hydrogen is closer to the negative oxygen end of the CO2 molecule. So what we're seeing here are dipole-dipole forces between water's dipole and the bond dipoles of carbon dioxide. When sucrose dissolves in water, the sucrose molecules are surrounded by hy hydrogen bonds to nearby water molecules. I've drawn these in approximate form as dotted lines, but this goes to show you that the hydrogen bonding potential of sucrose is extremely high. This is one reason why the solubility of sucrose in water is so high. When water is the solvent, the dissolved solute is written with the AQ phase designator after it, and we call AQ aqueous. It's worth keeping in mind, for example, this picture down here when you picture an aqueous solute. It's surrounded by water molecules engaging in intermolecular forces with the ion or dissolved particle. The conversion of a pure solute into solvated particles is a process called dissolution. And thermodynamically, dissolution is always entropically favored. Due to entropy of mixing, we've seen before that when we take two different substances and mix them, assuming they're ideal gases, delta S is greater than zero. And in fact, if we're only thinking about entropy, we can take enthalpy and intermolecular forces off the table and notice that from a pure entropic perspective, delta S is greater than zero for dissolution processes. Dissolution is driven enthalpically by intermolecular forces. That is to say, intermolecular forces between the solute molecules and the solvent molecules are replaced by solvent-solute interactions when the solute dissolves. Dissolution is only favored enthalpically, that is, delta H of solvation or dissolution is only less than zero when strong intermolecular forces are introduced upon dissolution. To write dissolution reactions, we start on the reactant side with the pure substance in its normal state, that is, its state at, say, room temperature and atmospheric pressure. And on the product side, we write the aqueous version of the reactant. So as an example, let's consider the dissolution of ethanol, CH3, CH2OH, in water. In its normal state at atmospheric pressure and room temperature, ethanol is a liquid. And when we dissolve it in water, it's transformed from a pure liquid to an aqueous solute. Even though we understand that implicitly water is involved in this process of solvation, we don't include water as an explicit reactant on the left-hand side. In fact, it's implied when we write the product as CH3, CH2OH, with the aqueous phase designator afterwards. For simple dissolution of covalent solutes like this, the stoichiometry will always be one-to-one, -one, since there's no breaking apart of the solute that happens upon dissolution. The solute simply gets surrounded by water molecules, which engage in intermolecular forces with the solute. Ionic compounds, however, do break apart when they're dissolved in water. And so when we're writing dissolution equations for ionic compounds, we have to write the aqueous ion separately and respect the conservation of mass, that is, take into account the stoichiometry and write proper stoichiometric coefficients. So for example, if we start with an ionic compound like lithium phosphate, like nearly all ionic compounds, Li3PO4 is a solid at room temperature and pressure. And the dissolution reaction for Li3PO4 in water involves, again, not writing water as an explicit reactant, even though we understand that it is involved in the microscopic process 
of lithium phosphate dissolving. And we write on the right-hand side the stoichiometry such that mass is conserved. So we have three aqueous lithium ions, and we have one aqueous phosphate ion on the product side. These ions break apart because each individual ion, the three cations and the anion, are solvated by an independent set of water molecules. To reiterate this one more time, it's very important to keep in mind this picture of an ion surrounded by water molecules in the aqueous or solvated state. It's the intermolecular forces between the surrounding solvent molecules and the ion that drive dissolution in an enthalpic sense. So we can think of the three lithium cations solvated like this and the much larger and actually polyatomic phosphate ion also solvated by more than likely a larger number of water molecules as well. In thinking about dissolution and precipitation equilibria, writing down these dissolution reactions as balanced chemical equations is really the essential important first step to getting started on solving equilibrium problems. So during dissolution, solvent comes between solute particles such as ions. That causes a separation of the ionic particles. But the solute particles can also re-stick to one another to reform pure solute. And we often think about this in the context of ions, but it can happen for solvated covalent compounds as well. A compound like sucrose can precipitate out if the interactions between solute particles are strong enough. This process is known as precipitation, and the resulting pure solute that comes out of solution, often as a solid, is called a precipitate. An example of a precipitation reaction is shown for you at the bottom of this slide. So initially we have aqueous A plus and B minus ions, which are represented as the blue and red spheres on the left. Precipitation occurs as the ions start finding each other and forming a solid mass at the bottom of the reaction system. This solid mass is what we call the precipitate. Precipitation is the microscopic reverse of dissolution. Notice that if we think about this reaction in reverse, this is just the dissolution of the solid AB solid AB separating into aqueous A plus and B minus ions. And so precipitation, the way this is written in the forward direction, is the reverse of dissolution. What this means is that precipitation and dissolution are in equilibrium, and we can apply the tools of equilibrium that we've learned so far to think about precipitation and dissolution. In particular, if you've learned about the solubility rules, you know that we can use them to predict in a qualitative way whether an ionic compound such as AB is soluble in water or not. But I actually want to put this soluble in quotation marks because something that the theory of chemical equilibrium tells us is that at equilibrium, there's always some amount of dissolved solute, even for solutes that are quote unquote insoluble. If we want to understand solubility in more detail, we have to move past the qualitative understanding to a quantitative understanding that's based on equilibrium principles. Before getting into the quantitative treatment of solubility equilibria, let's look at dissolution and precipitation on the microscopic level. In particular, let's look at strontium phosphate, which is SR3PO42, dissolving to form three strontium 2 plus cations and two phosphate anions. In this simulation environment, I have a salt shaker full of strontium phosphate and a beaker of water below. I'm gonna shake the salt shaker to deliver some solid and immediately, as soon as I deliver solid, notice that the ionic particles become surrounded by water molecules, which are too small to be shown, and begin roaming freely in solution. These are the dissolved solute particles that are roaming freely. Notice also at the bottom of the beaker, I have some amount of undissolved strontium phosphate still in a sort of regular crystalline pattern. This is meant to represent the undissolved solid solute. If I add a little bit more, strontium phosphate to this, you'll notice that that solid, for the most part, just sits there. There's a solid mass of undissolved strontium phosphate. Eventually, the numbers of dissolved ions and the numbers of ions we find within the solid in the so-called bound state come to be more or less constant. However, if we pay attention to what's going on on the surface of the solid, we see that particles are entering and leaving the solid constantly. This is a classic scenario of dynamic equilibrium, which we've seen before. Even though on the macroscopic level, 
the numbers of dissolved and bound solute particles, the numbers of dissolved and bound ions, are not changing with time or are changing only very little with time. On the microscopic level, all kinds of things are going on. Ions are coming in and leaving rapidly. As we've seen before, what's happening here is that the rate of dissolution of ions from the solid surface is equal to the rate of precipitation of ions from the dissolved state back to the solid state. This leads to a situation where, over time, the numbers of dissolved and bound ions are constant. This is a situation of dynamic equilibrium, and in particular, it's called solubility equilibrium. We'd like to be able to characterize quantitatively how many ions we find in solution given, for example, an initial amount of solid that we'd want to dissolve in some volume of water. This should sound a lot like an initial to equilibrium type of problem, and that's exactly what it is. We're interested in calculating the equilibrium concentrations of dissolved solute particles given initial conditions.